So the other project that I'll address tonight that emphasizes in-expert investigation and recasting is the Happy Valley Project. And I borrowed that name from the nearby city that it experienced such a high rate of foreclosures after the collapse of the housing bubble. And indeed, this project began as an investigation of housing foreclosures and uneven distribution of shelter. But as I worked, I riveted my attention especially to just having a better understanding of the financial speculation that underpinned the meltdown. Because I was interested in how to bring an artistic, an artistic and poetic gestures to ideas usually cordoned off in arcane description that I honestly tune out. And I wanted to figure out how to tune in um, through poetry and art. I'm recasting projects, as I mentioned, as a way to sustain attention. And I hope to bring a consciousness to my production also. Because I think about how we live in a mess of information. And part of my aim as a poet um, is to create forms that gather some of that mess and to give some of that mess through form some kind of, hopefully, some kind of significance. And I also hope to bring awareness of how much I add to the mess. So sometimes I bring an intentional slowness to the production of some of that work. And so as I read and researched uh, financial speculation, I also embroidered line by line a poem on an eight-foot drop cloth that I had previously used for domestic painting projects. Um, and I was also helped by my daughter. She would add French knots for dotting eyes. And my mother and my grandmother here who added stitches, and they're the ones who taught me to embroider. Beware the fury of the financier. Wrote fury, puffy money, bankers who bank on diverted attention, divested power. I attend to a kestrel showing its shadow to the morning floor, my neighbor's crusty music, my daughter's trusty lemur doll, a train sooty and passing four stories below. Power. This is a sentence about synthetic collateralized debt obligations, a bit of what gets lost in the paper shuffle of profit, doorway to a shelter, roof slope to slide rain, bankers bilking plenty. I'm riveting my attention now. So I tried all kinds of different projects all fall as I pursued this investigation. And one thing I did is I put a sandwich board out. I was working in a studio in Old Town, so I put a, a sandwich board out on Cooch and I would just add one line, like now I dwell the foreclosed valley, and dangle a Sharpie. And inevitably, it would be filled with lines. People just every day would fill it with lines and never steal the Sharpie. And, um, and so this one, I love the next line that came. Now I dwell the foreclosed valley, I sublet a box of shame. The, the real cornerstone of the project, um, the way in which I, I found a, a social form for it is through hosting econ salons. And econ salons predate the Happy Valley project. I hosted the first one um, during the fall of 2008, and I hosted it with Alicia Cohen at the Clinton Corner Cafe. And this is when the heft of the financial and thus economic crisis was sinking in, and I just wanted to better understand what was going on. And I wondered if cultural forms could contribute to my understanding. So this first econ salon, we had it at a conventional poetry reading venue, you know, with a, a candlelit bistro, but brought in economists to give talks, Kristen Sheeran and Robin Hanel, who actually teaches here now. Um, and I also wanted to see how poems and other cultural artifacts and actions might add to the conversation. So Jules read from his poem, Das Greenspan, at this and several subsequent econ salons. In this poem, the speaker's flirtation with the former chairman of the Federal Reserve, Alan Greenspan, mirrors a larger societal flirtation with neoliberalism. Das Greenspan, Volume 1, Chapter 1, Capital Liberalization. <laughs> it's been another unfettered kind of neon banner year 
for the strut your stuff, sexually attractive, seductible, desirable, alluring, toothsome, sensual, sultry, slinky, provocative, tempting, tantalizing, nubile, voluptuous, luscious, hot, lush, bettable, foxy, cute, booty, licious, <laughs> geezer, guy, fellow, fella, gent, joe, bloke, chap, dude, adult, male, gentleman that is, breathing steam into your international monetary fundraiser for daddy's guapo, sasso, gropador, buai buai, in a blue suit and khaki camo. So Das Greenspan playfully unmasks neoliberal ideology. Das Greenspan, Volume 2, Chapter 1, Deterritorialization. My father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my auntie, my nephew, my niece, euphemistic fiscal diction giving them a lot of grief. My father, my mother, my sister, my brother, my auntie, my nephew, my niece, he has that certain something, lacquered rapture sings relief. And how I see the prophetic potential of poetry is reading the present really well, which uh, Das Greenspan does. It's predictive of problems that arose from the cult of Greenspan. Das Greenspan, Volume 3, Chapter 2, Privatization. Then I think of Alan and his quirky sense of humor, his laissez-faire lips, his clarinet reed tongue, his cute wrinkled visage. Oh, Alan, you virtual regulatory czar, you guru of the producer price index, able-minded minder of the gold and silver, sagacious sentinel of the household debt service ratio, your rational exuberance unduly escalates me. When you say industrial production and capacity utilization, it makes me quiver. <laughs> Fetter me. Fetter me, you rational hedonist. <laughs> Fetter me with unfettered monetary policy and do it quick-like before it's too late. Because the difficulty lies not in new ideas, but in escaping the old ones. Another econ salon brought in the music of Cynthia Nelson, her money songs and poetry of Alison Cobb. But the largest econ salon I curated as part of the Happy Valley project was December 1st, this past December, in fieldwork. And I was interested in how gathering many ways of angling in on the financial meltdown and various kinds of housing crises might create conversations, both through the works themselves and also the different audiences that would gather for the different components of the econ salon. So um, the evening included various installations from a dollhouse squat set up by Right to Survive, which is a group of homeless or houseless people and their supporters fighting for rights. Um, and an installation by Jennifer Hardacker, a video shot on a conch shell um, called Shelter. And also a video project I worked on with Jen Coleman, Andrea Murray, Kristen Sheeran called It's a Wonderful Time to Buy. Um, and then there were a number of talks. Ibrahim Mubarak of Right to Survive addressed the crowd, as did Angela Martin of Economic Fairness Oregon, and she gave a talk about organizing people around foreclosures and credit card debt. And I collaborated with Mitch Heider and Jules Boykoff on a tale of magicians who puffed up money that lost its puff. You might ask just how the magicians puffed up money to quite that puff. <laughs> so this is a project that emerged from conversation with Jules and Mitch Heider, who's a magician and a whistler who lives in Eugene, Oregon. One off afternoon when we gathered in his living room for magic shows um, with our daughter, and we began to talk about how we could cast speculative financiers as magicians gone bad. So after, over the next few months, I began to write this story and try to really tell the story of the financial meltdown, not skimping on the sort of details of, of, the, of the speculative mechanisms. And I would mail this story back and forth to Eugene. And Mitch and I would work out the resonances between financial shenanigans and magic tricks that Mitch might perform. The process was one where my commitment to, the, to trying to tell the story informed how we thought about magic, 
and how we thought about magic informed how I could possibly tell the story. So as I wrote, I would also try out the drafts on our daughter, Jessie, she's here building the book, um, to test the language because informed by how, as I mentioned before, how I tune out financial descriptions and I realized that tuning out is, such, is a way of remaining powerless and this was a project about thinking about how to make creative forms in order to investigate power. I strove to write a story that would be built on sound and imagery and playfulness, disrupting the way finance is usually conveyed.